Hi, I'm Jackie Waldberger with Belmont Village Senior Living. It is our honor to host Dr. Jesty and Dr. Erica Lee today as they discuss the scientific roots of wisdom and compassion. Since 1997, Belmont Village has collaborated with academic partners and healthcare experts to provide best in class safety, engagement, and hospitality. To learn more about Belmont Village, I invite you to stay on the call after the presentation. Today, we have several hundred participants. Please use the Q&A feature for as many questions as time allows after the presentation. Before we introduce our guests, I'd like to introduce to you someone who is exemplary of wisdom and compassion. She has changed the lives of tens of thousands of seniors across our country, including her own parents. A Harvard graduate, she is multi-talented, multilingual, a successful businesswoman, and the CEO and founder of our innovative company. Ladies and gentlemen, Patricia Will. Jackie, thank you for that introduction. And to all of you in the audience, thank you so much for being here today to share in the knowledge of wisdom. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be introducing two great friends who are among the most renowned professionals in geriatric psychology and psychiatry, not just in our country, but in the world. For years, Belmont Village has enjoyed rich collaboration with these experts in our quest to understand how to best enable seniors to thrive. I'll start in alpha order with Dr. Linda Erkeley. Dr. Erkeley is the Director of Geriatric Psychology at the UCLA Medical School. She is a leading researcher and clinician for the remediation of cognitive difficulties associated with aging and dementia. She also leads UCLA's Center for Longevity, where I proudly serve on the board. Not coincidentally, Dr. Erkeley shares an import, important academic roots with our other speaker, Dr. Dilip Jesty. In fact, she recently told me that her first published paper at UCLA was written in collaboration with Dr. Jesty's team at UC San Diego. Listening to these two for me for many years is like drinking from a fire hose, and very soon you'll see why. Dr. Dilip Jesty had a rich career at the NIH before starting the geriatric psychiatry program at UC San Diego Medical School from scratch back in the 80s. Today, he serves as the Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences at UCSD, as well as the Director of the Stein Institute for Recent Research on Aging and the Center for Healthy Aging. And here's something fascinating. He's also the co-director of the UC San Diego IBM Center on Artificial Intelligence for healthy living. Now think about that for a second. Artificial intelligence, healthy living. His curiosity and drive have taken him and his team to places heretofore not explored in the neurobiology of the brain, like resilience, and of course, our subject today, wisdom. Most recently, he co-authored a book called Wiser that is effectively uh, the subject of his talk today. So I'm not going to give anything away but rather it's my great pleasure first to turn the floor over to you, Dr. Dilip Jesty. Thank you, Patricia, for a very kind introduction. Uh, it really has been my pleasure to know you and work with Belmont for a number of years. Uh, hands down, Belmont is one of the finest senior housing communities in the world. And we have worked closely. And recently, we did a study. This was a study of raise your resilience intervention. Uh, it was really not an easy study. It was a randomized control trial, control group, experimental group, and the treatment was provided by trained staff at the facility. It was highly successful. The paper that was published which has co-authors from Belmont, was 
the recipient of silver award for research in aging given by the Mather Foundation. So I'm very proud of having worked with Belmont in so many different ways. So thank you, Patricia. And it's also my pleasure to have worked with uh, Dr. Arkoli. Um, she started actually her work in geriatric psychology at UCSD. Uh, and I've been amazed at seeing the progress of her career at uh, UCLA. So it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here. So I'm going to talk for about 20 minutes about wisdom, and then we will have discussions with Dr. Arkoli, Patricia, uh, and question from the audience. So I'm sh share, let me share my sorry, sh slides. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. So the topic of my talk is actually the topic of the book also, Wiser, the scientific roots of wisdom, compassion, and what makes us good. What is wisdom? Wisdom is a personality trait. And by a trait, one means some characteristic patterns of behavior. We know that different people act in different ways. They think, feel differently. Some people are more resilient. Some are more optimistic. Some are pessimistic. So these are personality traits. Wisdom is a unique trait in that it has different components. And what are those components? The first and foremost, is called pro-social behaviors. These are things that we do for other people unselfishly. So these include empathy, which is sharing other people's emotions and compassion, which means helping other people. The second component is emotional regulation. That is control over our emotions. Think about a teenager and his emotions fluctuate from hour to hour, minute to minute, right? And think about a wise old person who is calm, controlled, and you can count on that person to be not easily upset. So that is emotional regulation. Self-reflection, the ability to look inwards and try to understand ourselves. You know, when something goes wrong, the usual tendency is to blame others, blame something else. Instead of that, thinking whether I did something wrong that caused it, that I could do better next time, that is self-reflection. Then comes accepting uncertainty and diversity of perspectives. So I have strong values about something, but I can understand why someone else may have different values. That doesn't mean I have to agree with that person, but we can still be friends, even though we think differently. And while we accept uncertainty and diversity, we also have to be decisive when needed. We cannot procrastinate and not make a decision because this side may be right, that side may be right. No, we have to be decisive when called for. And lastly, spirituality. Spirituality is different from religiosity. People belong to, to any religion or even people who don't be, believe in religion. Uh, atheist can be spiritual. Spirituality means feeling connected to something or someone that we can't see, whether you call it consciousness, soul, or God, whatever you call that. But that constant connectedness is important. So these are the components of wisdom as a personality trait. How do you measure it? There are scales for measuring different traits. So we developed a scale 
called San Diego Wisdom Scale or STYs. The scale has 28 items. Each item describes a person's behavior. And you say to what extent you disagree or agree with that statement. We have shown that this is reliable, valid. It has already been translated into several languages. Examples of the items. It is important that I understand the reasons for my actions. So this is self-reflection, that you want to understand the reasons for your action. Second is I have trouble thinking clearly when I'm upset. That means when I'm upset, the emotions take over and I cannot think logically. So that's opposite of emotional regulation. So there are 28 such items. And this is a scale that uh, we include in our book, Wiser. You can take the scale. It'll just take 10, 15 minutes. But then you'll get a score for each component of wisdom. And that's really important because none of us is strong in all the items or weak in all the items. So we have strengths and weaknesses. So you can find out where we are somewhat weaker and need help. Wisdom, like other personality traits, is partly based in the brain. And I don't want to go into technical details. If there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But the point I want to make is that there are specific regions of the brain, especially prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that makes us human. That's what distinguishes us from all other animals, this large prefrontal cortex. Another part though is amygdala, which is the oldest part of the brain in evolution. So wisdom reflects balance between the newest and the oldest parts of the brain. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. And you know, I wondered why not only do we live long, but why is the longevity increasing? Average lifespan today in the US is about 81 years higher in women than in men, it'll rise to 90 in just a few decades. And this long lifespan does not make sense from the perspective of Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. What is Darwin's hypothesis? He said that animals live only so long as they can reproduce. Because in every species, people die, the animals die, and they need to be replaced with a younger one. So you are useful to the species only so long as you produce children. In humans, we have menopause in women around age 45, 50. In men, we have something similar called andropause, similar age 45, 50. That means after 45, 50, we do not reproduce. We cannot reproduce. And yet, we'll, if we live to age 90, that means half of our lifespan we are spending without contributing to species survival. That doesn't make sense. That doesn't happen in the world outside. Most animals in the wild, they die almost as soon as they stop um, reproducing. That means that probably there is some age-associated change that occurs in humans that contributes to species survival. And that's actually phenomenal sort of thinking, how can that happen? And there is something called grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. I'm sorry, you can't see the title of the slide, but it says grandmother hypothesis of wisdom. This is really some very interesting science. What does it mean? So at the top, you see the grandparents. Right. Next is a middle is an adult daughter. Okay. So what this hypothesis states is that when grandparents, especially grandma, is involved in helping her daughter, adult daughter, raise children, that adult daughter lives longer, is happier, and produces more children than her mom did. She produces more children because she has time to produce children. 
if she didn't have help, she'll be spending all her time bringing up the one or two kids that she had. So the grandma cannot reproduce anymore after menopause, but she helps the younger generation live longer, be happier, and be more fertile. So that is how older people contribute to the species survival. And some of my colleagues at UCSD have described what are called grandparent genes. If you have the genes, you will not only live longer, but you'll have better functioning hearts and brains. So you can actually, you are capable of grandparenting. Many studies have shown that we age, we usually become wiser. You know, this is an apply to everybody. I mean, there are some unwise old people and there are wise young people, but by and large, as we age, our emotional regulation increases. We become more positive. We forget about the negative emotions and memories quickly. We become more empathic and compassionate. We help others, less selfish. We become more self-reflective. And we make better decisions that require experience because aging comes with experience. And all of us, if you think about that, I mean, I know that I don't want to be in my 20s again. <laughs> there was such a period of stress, peer pressure, anxiety, depression. Because with age, we become more positive, more compassionate, emotionally regulated. So wisdom does increase with aging in most people. And there are studies that have shown how older people are very important for younger generations. This was a study done in the UK. They studied 1,500 secondary school students age 11 to 16. And they followed these kids over a period of several years. They found that those children in whose upbringing grandparents were involved, when these kids grew up, they had fewer emotional problems. They were more pro-social more empathy, compassion, and they had fewer adjustment difficulties than the kids who were not helped by their grandparents when they were kids. And this was especially true among teenagers from single parent families or step parent families where actually the problem behaviors are more common. So grandparent involvement actually has long-term positive effect for the children. And another study which shows how these intergenerational activities are useful for both generations. This is a remarkable study called Experience Score. It was done at Johns Hopkins, although some of those faculty are actually are now at UCLA. <clears throat> it was supported by MacArthur Foundation. This was done back in the 1990s or early 2000. What they did was, they took some older people over the age of 65 from the community who had retired, okay? So retired old people. They divided them into two groups. One group was trained to spend some time in public elementary school to help the kids there, okay? They had to spend at least 15 hours a week for one full year in public elementary school. So these people, they went there, they, you know, they helped with their math, reading, but also in general, how is life and so on. The other group of older people didn't do that. After one year, they found that the kids who were helped by these older people, they did very well. These kids were happy, very happy. Their grades went through the roof. What about the older people? The older people, their mental health improved, physical health improved, and their biomarkers of stress and aging in blood and urine improved. And look at this, the volume of the hippocampus on brain MRI was larger at the end of the study in older people who worked with these kids compared to those who did not. This does not mean that the volume of hippocampus increased. What it means is that it did not shrink the way it did in other people. So this kind of intergenerational activity actually has positive impact on both generations. And that's one of the reasons actually I admire Belmont because it is focusing on intergenerational activities. How is that possible? How can anything get better with aging? 
and talked about different components of wisdom. Studies and a lot of research has shown that people who are active, this is important, older people who are active, active physically, cognitively, socially, mentally, you know, like all of you in the audience, you're doing something to stimulate your brain and psyche. There'll be greater recruitment and more efficient utilization of neuronal networks. There'll be formation of new synapses and new neurons in some regions of the brain. And the amygdala becomes less responsive to the stressful stimuli in older age, in people who are active. Let me go up there. So this shows that being active helps older people to have their brain continue to evolve in later life. Now, let's look at something exact opposite, something that is bad and that has been causing problem for the society, loneliness. Loneliness has been a major problem. You know, we all know about COVID pandemic, which killed half a million Americans. But did you know that before the COVID pandemic, we had a behavioral pandemic for 20 years. This is the pandemic of loneliness, social isolation, suicides, opioid related deaths. Loneliness is as dangerous to health as smoking and obesity. 162,000 Americans die per year from loneliness. And this has been happening for the last nearly 20 years. In the UK, a new minister of loneliness was appointed in 2018 because of loneliness of the worker. So this is really a very serious thing. Uh, suicides, look at this. The suicides have increased by 33% in the last 20 years. And that is because of increased loneliness, especially in younger people. The good news, this is the good news, that wisdom may be the vaccine for this pandemic of loneliness, suicide, and opioid use. That people who score high on wisdom scale, they're not lonely and vice versa. So there is a solution to this pandemic and that solution lies in wisdom. Uh, let me skip through some slides because I want to leave enough time for question and answer. Okay, so wisdom goes in the opposite direction as loneliness. The question is, can we enhance wisdom? And the answer is yes. Wisdom is only about 50% inherited. That means 50% can be modified by environment and behavior. Wisdom increases with aging, experience and learning, but is reduced when there is specific brain trauma or disease. That means we can modify wisdom. We can modify it through psychosocial behavioral intervention at this time. But in future, I'm sure we will have pharmacological, biological, even technological interventions. And there is a lot of research showing that you can increase empathy, compassion, altruism, emotional regulation, spirituality today with interventions. So there are techniques that are there that can help. So what can we all do? How do we increase the wisdom? The first thing is honest self-reflection. So what I would suggest is everybody should take this San Diego wisdom scale. Uh, you'll get the scores on each component. You'll find out which components you may need some help. Then you can try to increase those components. There are, and that is what is we have described in our book, Wiser. Uh, for example, if you want to increase compassion, how do we increase it? One is role playing, putting on blindfolds for 48 hours. You will understand what a blind person feels like. Be in a wheelchair for 48 hours then you understand the feeling of a person in a wheelchair. Keep a gratitude diary. Actually, gratitude diary was a part of this resilience intervention that we did at um, Belmont. And we are very pleased to see that the people participating in that study, they continue writing a gratitude diary even after the study stopped. That is great. So just write a couple of things before you go to bed that make you feel grateful. And finally, just random acts of kindness. But it's not compassion only toward other people. You have to be self-compassionate. Be kind to yourself. 
what do you do? Offer yourself soothing and comfort that you would offer to your friend. When you make a mistake, don't over blame yourself. Everybody makes mistake and we can learn from that. And when you are stressed out, sure, we have been stressed out in the past, you came out of that and that will happen again. So this is my last slide, nearly last slide. So today's society, again, what is happening in the last 20 some years is that society has become increasingly stressed, increasingly polarized, angry, anxious, and depressed. As I showed you, the rates of suicides have gone up by 33% in just 20 years. There are Gallup surveys that show that people have become much more anxious, angry uh, than they were before. So there is this modern pandemic of loneliness, suicides, opioid related deaths of despair. And that has been going on before COVID came into play. But the good news is we can do something for that by enhancing and promoting wisdom. So in our schools, in our businesses, we need to promote compassion, self-reflection, accepting diverse perspectives, spirituality. We can do that. And if we do that, we will find that we can transform today's lonely, distressed, and polarized world into happier, healthier, and wiser society. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and I look forward to discussion with uh, all of you. Let me stop share. And... Okay. Dr. Jesty, um, thank you so much for that. Um, as I said at the beginning, listening to Dr. Jesty is like drinking from a fire hose because there's so much richness in the many subjects, um, but chiefly um, uh, describing wisdom and then understanding how we uh, older people have the gift of wisdom, uh, I say we, and then further uh, uh, how we can enhance wisdom um, at any age. Uh, Dr. Erkeley, I'd like to start with a question to you that relates to wisdom. Um, you work extensively uh, in your clinics with seniors who are experiencing some sort of cognitive decline or think experience cognitive decline. As people become forgetful, can they still be wise? And if so, why don't we place enough value on that trait in them? And this is really a question first for you, but Dr. Jesty, I'd love for you to chime in uh, to the extent that you'd like to speak to that. Okay, definitely. Thank you again for inviting me here to be here today. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, to, to answer your question, my personal experience with, with patients and, and their families is that people do maintain wisdom th through dementia, at least until a certain point. I mean, especially in the kind of more earlier stages, while people can actually remember their past experiences and draw on their older knowledge because it tip in, a, in like Alzheimer's disease, it's these older memories that are preserved for later into the course. And in fact, one of the, one of the I would say problems or shortcomings in, in communicating and helping somebody with dementia is not to address what they already know and their wisdom and their life experiences. So that I believe could be a bridge. And, it, and we know it's a bridge through reminiscing and storytelling and, um, and those ways of communicating knowledge and life experience is, is, needs to be utilized more um, between let's say a, a family, an affected family member and, and one of their loved ones. In fact, we know that this is an important therapy in people with dementia is reminiscence therapy. So you can capitalize on their, their accumulated life knowledge. And if they haven't had any changes in their personality, they, they still will maintain whatever positive traits they had, whether they were giving, whether they were empathetic and caring. I think the, the types of dementia, and I'm gonna to defer to Dr. Justy on this, but the other types of dementia 
that we will see less of this is when the frontal lobes are affected, as in a frontal temporal dementia or in a brain injury that involves the frontal lobes, which, which he well describes in, in um, Weiser. So yes, and, and this is something that I try to communicate to families when we're doing feedback sessions where we may have to give them bad news about their memory, but we want to enhance and, and bolster that they still have a lot to give. And part of what they have to give is, is their wisdom. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Dr. Jesty? No, I agree 100% with uh, what Dr. Arkoli said, that I have seen older people with uh, Alzheimer's disease who, even when they have moderately severe dementia or even more than that, they continue to be very pleasant. They continue to have good social manners. Uh, and uh, so these are people who have been wise all their life. And even when they have dementia, they still maintain that wisdom. And it's really a pleasure to see that. But as Dr. Arkoli said, it depends on the type of dementia. It is true if it is frontotemporal dementia, uh, which affects the prefrontal cortex uh, that I showed in my slide, then uh, often the traits of wisdom are impaired. But um, the most common dementia is Alzheimer's. And so we can do our best uh, them to the ex extent that we can to help them mentor their positivity. Again, reminiscence therapy, that Dr. Arkoli mentioned is very effective in many people. So underlying that, I think the message that I take away and that I'd like to take away from our audience is mm -hmm. that experiencing cognitive decline does not uh, correlate to a kind of foolhardy uh, presence. Uh, wisdom is still there. And I think that's incredibly important for us both as family members and as practitioners understand. Dr. Erkeley, I'd like to turn it back to you. When you started your career at UCLA, um, you were in the uh, basement, as I recall, of the medical school doing pioneering work in imaging the brain. And I can remember that you and your colleagues were featured or your colleagues were featured on the cover of Time magazine uh, for actually accomplishing the miracle of the uh, three-dimensional scan in the early 2000s. Uh, it leads me to understand the evolution of that, um, try to understand the evolution of that and how it enables Dr. Jesty to know that wisdom is lodged in the frontal cortex and the amygdala. So let, let's talk a little bit. To me, that's fascinating. You, um, so if you're talking about the, the evolution of our technology, yeah, and how that how that ha has contributed or aids the type of research such as what doc Dr. Justy does, mm -hmm. um, I think it's part of our bedrock. So when you're looking at there's different types of data that people can collect. So one is behavioral data, and these are things that we observe, like if we give someone cognitive testing, we can observe that. Then we can collect data on um, on what people tell you. So the 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 wise San Diego wise scale is is based on what people tell you about how they see themselves on the various um, components that make up wisdom. And then there's how the brain functions. And, and there's also the structure of the brain. And so we have been able to dive a lot deeper into the biology, the physiology, and the anatomy of the brain through these technologies. And so important is not just what the brain looks like, but how it functions. So when we do imaging, that looks at a functional MRI, that looks at actually momentary micro changes in blood flow and how the brain is connected, the regions are connected to each other. Or we're looking at blood flow or we're looking at glucose metabolism in the brain. And so through these types of imaging, and we, can, we even can go so far as to look at metabolites of the brain. And, and what's you know in in our brain with metabolize and, and that gives us an indication of how brain functions as well. 
So we can, we can now correlate how the brain functions which what, with what we see behaviorally and with what people tell us. And, and we can look at how that function changes over time. So to really learn, it's, it's almost like scuba diving mm -hmm. in the brain. We get to look under the water and see what kind of life there is under there instead of trying to surmise this from the tides and the waves. So I think brain imaging allows us to really see and, and develop and validate the types of concepts that Dr. Justy is studying. Thank you for that. I think that to um, ask you both a question, and I'll start with you, Dr. Justy. Um, you talked a little while ago about the effects of isolation, um, particularly on all people really, but particularly on uh, older adults. Needless to say, this pandemic has exacerbated the problem significantly. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the side effects of isolation for a year on seniors who were living home alone? And can you surmise that there may be a measurable difference for seniors who are living in community? You may not have studied that yes, yet, but how do you think about it? Yeah, thank you, Patricia, for, for an excellent question. There is no doubt that loneliness and social isolation are bad for the brain as well as the rest of the body. Numerous studies have shown, numerous studies have shown that loneliness and social isolation are associated with worse metabolic illnesses like diabetes, worse cardiovascular diseases like heart disease, um, worse dementia, uh, worse uh, depression, anxiety disorder, every which way, part of that is genetic, but part of that is actually environmentally determined. Person who is lonely is not likely to go around and so it becomes a vicious circle. If you feel lonely, then you're less likely to approach other people and that will make you feel even more lonely. And when people live by themselves, in older age, that does become a bigger problem because you are living only with your spouse, you don't have other people. Uh, and sometimes, you know, even the spouse is uh, not there, unfortunately, and then you are by yourself. And what COVID did was it totally stopped interactions with people outside. Uh, younger people could handle through technology, but older people, many of them are not familiar. So people who are living by themselves really ran into bigger problems than people in communities of older people. Because there, they always had other people whom they could see, they could talk to, they could call. And so social isolation clearly becomes a problem for older people living by themselves. I have not seen any study directly compare people living alone versus those in senior housing communities. But if it did, uh, I know question that during the COVID year, that things would have been much worse probably for people living by themselves than uh, those who are living in a community. Thank you. Anything to add on that, Dr. Erkeley? Yeah, I definitely agree with, with what uh, Dr. Jesty said that um, I think we're going to learn a lot more about loneliness in the research that follows this pandemic. But, uh, you know, I, I see it anecdotally in, in the patients that I work with it, it, is that they're struggling even more now because of the loneliness. And this, I work on some depression studies with another one of our esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Lavretsky, who, who mm -hmm. Dr. Justy knows. And mm -hmm. you hear this, like if you're, doing a, if you're doing an interview with them, they're talking about how lonely they are, how cut off and isolated they are. And this is largely due to the pandemic. What, what I do wonder about, I'm gonna throw this question back at Dr. Justy, is do you know of any any evidence or even what is your what is your thought on how much loneliness can contribute to allopathic load the 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 chronic stress that tears down uh, the body's uh, immunity and and ability to 
fight the disease. What, what do you think about that? I think there is definitive evidence that that does happen. Um, there have been some long-term follow-up study and they found that people who were lonely to start with, if you followed them over a period of four to six years, those who were lonely were much more likely to develop dementia or major depression or some of the other diseases. So it looks that this longer term loneliness that is sustained is likely to be making the inflammation and other biological processes worse so that the risk of developing dementia, depression, heart disease, other metabolic disorders increases. So definitely loneliness is something that is bad for health. Uh, I mean, it has been called a silent epidemic. It has been called a grand challenge to the society. And as I said, this has been going on for 20 years and COVID only made it uh, worse. Uh, while we're on the subject of COVID and I wanna come back to wisdom and resilience and uh, uh, building um, our, our mental capacities, um, but uh, we're seeing a lot uh, written now about long COVID. And since seniors suffered from COVID-19 more than any other segment of the population, uh, and fortunately, uh, most of them are survivors, um, we see uh, neurological symptoms in uh, seniors who have suffered, and all people really who have suffered from COVID-19. Uh, is there a way to handicap the long-term effects uh, from a neurological perspective? You know, I mean, th that's a great question. It's a question that is being uh, considered actually in all the circles, all of the medical circles, that people are really discovering that there are some long-term effects. It's not clear what they are, how long they last, what can we do, because we are just still gathering data. You know, I mean, it is only in the last few months that uh, this thing has come to the fore. So I don't think we can make any definitive recommendations at this stage. However, I think what we need to do is of course be careful uh, in terms of social distancing and others, but also try to have some kind of social relationship. It doesn't need to be physically social relationship that may not be possible because of uh, the requirements, but through FaceTime, emails, videos, we really need to keep contact with the family and friends. My hunch is that that will help reduce some of the long-term effects. Thank you, Dr. Jesty. Um, I can't, uh, uh, there's some questions coming in from the audience and uh, we're happy to field those as well. Um, but one more uh, important one that I have uh, has to do with what I call the takeaways. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Dr. Erkeley, and uh, given your expertise and the tremendous training that you do um, in how to maintain uh, and enhance cognition, um, if you had to pick five things that all of our listeners could be attentive to and that we could put into practice if we already know, what would be Dr. Erkeley's five best tips for maintaining cognition? I would put social connectivity at the top of that list, uh, which dovetails with everything that Dr. Jesse has been talking about today, because social contact covers a lot of bases. It covers cognitive stimulation. It covers helping to offset or prevent loneliness. It's good for people who have depression. And, um, and in some cases, it can be part of exercising if you're doing something, you know, dancing or, or walking or hiking with a friend, something like that. So, but social connectivity, I would say, is um, number one because it can take care of a lot of things. Uh, the other is to, to remain curious, lifelong learning continue to stimulate yourself. It doesn't have to be doing Sudoku uh, or crossword puzzles. It could be anything that you find stimulating, but hopefully something new and some variety. 
So going to lecture like this, um, if there's somebody in the Belmont village, you know, what do you try to do? You encourage people to, to get involved in the activities that you offer. So again, it doesn't matter where you live, um, if you live by yourself or you live in a community to stay cognitively stimulated, certainly um, don't smoke. That's one of the, the major factors that uh, has been identified in, uh, I believe this was Christine Yaffe's work in San Francisco about what contributes to cognitive decline. We definitely don't want people to smoke. Like that has to go right off the list. Um, and good, good diet. Right, so that's up there with exercise, trying to watch your body mass index and and so eating properly and and getting exercise that would be those would be, I would say, the five that um, come come to mind as being of major importance. As a researcher in this field, um, uh, what is it that you eat? <laughs> um, you know, in many ways, I'm very fortunate to come from a family with heart problems and high cholesterol. And uh, so that has been kind of drilled into me since I was 13 years old. And so I really try to watch kind of all of my, my uh, fat intake, carbohydrate intake. I'm kind of a moderation person, so I don't really deprive myself of a lot, but I really, I definitely believe in this uh, is to reduce the sugar be careful of the carbs, watch the, the fats. Um, I do not do fast food and I don't miss it. And, and to couple that with exercise. So I practice what I, I preach. Um, but like I said, in my family, there's a genetic risk for this. So, um, you know, I have to toe the line for my own health. So I can relate to my patients on this, right? I'm not, I don't ask people to do anything that I don't think is important for me to do. Thank you for that. So, Dr. Jesty, um, if you were to try to encapsulate um, again for us, um, either the top tips for making us wiser, things that we can do, um, assuming that we're old and already wise, um, uh, what would they be? So, thank you for this question. So, so the first is, try to increase empathy and compassion toward others and toward yourself. This is important. Um, increasing empathy and compassion toward others, in a way, some, comes easier because we have been through tough times and we can empathize with other people. But often I find that people who are very compassionate toward others, they're harsh on themselves. They don't forgive themselves if they make a mistake. Uh, feel guilty. Um, and there is also some sex difference, interestingly, that women are more compassionate toward other people than men. But women are so harsher on themselves, so they're less self-compassionate than men. And this is something where actually one needs good balance. Clearly, we have to be nice to others, but also be kind to yourself. So, so that's one thing important. Second is avoiding extremes of emotion and being more positive. Really, I can't stress that enough. Positivity is important. Again, think about the teenagers or the 20s when we are so stressed out, peer pressure, and we are comparing ourselves with other people. And we feel that we are not doing as well as somebody else. And we see ourselves through other people's eyes. What do other people think of me? That affects my self-image. That shouldn't happen. I mean, now we have done a lot in our life. We have been successful in many ways. Nobody's perfectly successful, but so we should feel proud of ourselves and feel positive. We have been through stresses and we will come through any new stress also. So, so that's important. Positivity is the second thing I would uh, strongly encourage. Third is accepting diversity of perspectives by interacting with people who are different from us. And that starts with age. Older people should interact with younger people. I mean, I really think this is something so useful for the whole society. You know, 
So we have been actually doing some studies at UCSD. We sent our engineering students to work with uh, people in uh, some retirement communities. They formed a team to find out how they can develop some technology that will be helpful to the older people. They worked together for a year um, and they came up with some brilliant products. The younger people were very impressed how smart these older people are. You know, this, usually there's ageism, you know, older people don't know much about technology. They're surprised how quickly they learn technology, older people. And so that was very helpful. And they also appreciate the kindness that was shown by older people. On the other hand, older people were impressed how smart the younger ones were, how quickly they learned different things. So it really was a perfect balance of the two and jointly they form great team. So intergenerational activities, again, as I said, I cannot overstress the importance, but, but also diversity from other perspectives. You know, in today's world, we have become very polarized. People have one kind of thinking and we don't talk with people who have other kind of thinking. We should try to do that. That helps us, right? So, so that's one thing I would stress. Then ability to make decisions that are helpful, but that are also timely. You know, so as we get older, we sort of weigh pros and cons of everything and we may not be able to make a decision. That's not useful. We have to make a decision from time to time. And we don't have to worry about the long-term consequences. You know, something I decide today, a year later that may be proved wrong, but I, I shouldn't blame myself because I didn't know how things were going to turn out. So, in general, I would say, if we do all of these things, especially focusing on self-compassion as well as compassion toward others, uh, positivity with emotional regulation, working with diverse groups of people, especially across generations, some self-reflection, and finally, spirituality. Spirituality in the sense, meditation, mindfulness, something that makes you connected because if you feel connected constantly, you'll never feel lonely. Thank you, Dr. Jesty, and really thank uh, both of you. Um, as someone who's worked for years with both of these individuals, um, I want to express my gratitude, not only for your presentation today, but for the richness of what you do and how we've been able to integrate it into every day at Belmont Village. Uh, I'd like to turn at this point now. Uh, one thing um, that I should mention is that a number of people have written into the chat line uh, requesting how they can connect with the many lectures and teachings that happen at the UCLA Center for Longevity or at the Stein Center for Research on Aging at UCSD. If you put your name in the chat line, we'll get you that information. Um, and because there is a richness of program in both institutions um, that you can share. In. At this point, I turn this back to my colleague uh, with gratitude to her for organizing it all, Jackie Walperger. Jackie, back to you. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Dr. Jesse and Dr. Eric Coley. This has been amazing. Um, and I appreciate um, how you've tied in the engagement and socialization that Belmont Village does. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to my good friend uh, who has been with Belmont Village really since our conception really. And she'd like to talk a little bit about Belmont Village and our lifestyle. I'll turn it over to Susan Berger. Thank you, Jackie. Wisdom can improve your life in all aspects as we've learned physical, emotional, mental, financial, and learning from the experiences of others is very important and their sharing of that wisdom is as well. But wisdom is also what life and its experiences teach us. And to that point, most often, Belmont Village communities are filled by word of mouth that comes from our own residents and their families and professionals as they share their positive experiences with others. For 24 years, Belmont Village has owned and operated best in class, fully licensed senior living communities that are founded on the belief that all seniors 
deserve to live happy, self-directed lives in a supportive community, one that's filled with new friendships and interests, safety and security, quality and value, and above all, a place that our residents can call home. We recognize that lifestyle has a profound impact on one's brain health. What you eat and drink, how much you exercise, and the way you socialize are all critically important to good brain health. Just as our name suggests, our villages focus on bringing people together while providing them with a better quality of life. Our communities offer independent, assisted and memory care support. And although residents' needs may vary, everyone can count on our caring and compassionate staff who are committed to providing high quality, person-centered care. And our residents and their families have peace of mind because they know that our Belmont Village nurses are trained medical professionals are on site 24 hours a day to serve the healthcare needs of each resident and to give everyone peace of mind. And for those experiencing cognitive impairment and early stage memory loss, Belmont Village provides a therapeutic whole brain fitness lifestyle that combines our exceptional wellness model with mental fitness. This innovative approach to memory care perhaps you've heard about is called the circle of friends and is changing how providers and families now look at assisted living and memory care. But the goal of all of our programs, whether you're independent, assisted or more advanced stages of cognitive impairment is to provide those residents with the just right challenge every day so that they can feel successful and have a newfound sense of purpose. We strive to create a positive experience for all of our members, including our residents, our families, our employees, and we continue to set new standards in resident and family satisfaction. And we've also been recognized as a great place to work and named to Fortune Magazine's top 50 best workplaces for aging services by our 4,000 employees nationwide. And with all of the accolades that Belmont has received, it is no wonder why our communities continue to fill by word of mouth. If you have questions about a Belmont village near you or would like to learn more about what makes our communities so unique, I hope that you will give me a call, send me a text or an email. My phone number is 424-232-0701. And my email is sberger at belmontvillage.com. Again, my name is Susan Berger, a trusted family advisor. And it's always my pleasure to assist families as they try to navigate the many options in senior living, either for themselves or their loved one. Take the time to compare. Don't wait for a crisis to react. Thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing all of you at our next event. Bye-bye.